pokój jest rzeczą cenną i pożądaną. Nasza generacja, zmawiana w wojnach, na pewno na okres pokoju zasługuje. Ale pokój, jak prawie wszystkie sprawy tego świata, ma swoją cenę. Wysoką, ale zwymierną. My, Polsce, nie znamy pojęcia pokoju za wszelką cenę. Before the sunrise over the border town of Vielun, a formation of German JU-87B bombers arrived. The defenseless town was brutally awoken at 4.40 a.m. when the first bombs fell on the marketplace and surrounding buildings, including a marked hospital and 13th century church. Vielun was almost completely ruined. The number of victims has never been confirmed. On the other side of Poland, at 4.45 a.m., the German training battleship Schleswig-Holstein began firing on Westerplatte. Huge 280mm Cal missiles devastated the Polish enclave in the area of the free city of Gdańsk. At the same time, SS and Marine troops began continental attack. From the second day, Captain Franciszek Dąbrowski led the command of over 200 Polish defenders. Polish radio continually repeated the message, Westerplatte is still defending. On 7th September, this message was transmitted for the last time. Terrorist raids of Luftwaffe were supposed to scare civilians and force them into panicked escape, blocking the movements of the Polish army. Among many examples of such barbarity, the bombing raid over Farmpol must be mentioned. Captain Władysław Fraginis commanded over 300 Polish soldiers in the Polish fortified defense positions of Wizna. Hugely outnumbered, they attacked 40,000 soldiers from the German 19th Corps. After three days of fighting, the Germans threatened to shoot their Polish captives unless they surrendered. Captain Reginis pledged to his men that he would not leave his post alive. The Wehrmacht committed war crimes against Polish soldiers, thereby breaking the Hague Convention, murdering over 3,000 captives during the campaign. The most horrible of these crimes took place in Zakroczym and Ciepielów. The 50-meter training parachute tower in Katowice became a very important observation tower during the first days of war. On 3rd September, after the retreat of Polish army, the tower was taken by boy and girl scouts. Exchanging fire from the tower with Wehrmacht and Freikorps militias, the scouts fought on until the next day. Finally, the Germans used an anti-tank gun to destroy the tower and kill the remaining scouts. From the first day of war, the German troops fulfilled Adolf Hitler's words to kill, without pity or mercy, all men, women and children of Polish descent or language. 
At this time, over 450 villages were burned, thereby committing war crimes on innocent civilians. These German pacifications were revenge against the action of Polish partisans and for losses in local fights. The first pacifications were perpetrated in the villages Zimnowoda, Parzemiechy and Torzeniec. Civilians were murdered barbarically, often whole families were burned alive. Actions like this were conducted in towns too, like Zwotow, where over 200 Polish and Jewish civilians were murdered and 80% of the town was destroyed. As a result of the Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact on 17th of September, the Soviets invaded Poland from the east. Outposts of the Border Protection Corps could not stop the Red Assault. In many places, confused by the order from Ryd Śmigły, Polish soldiers put up heroic resistance. Masses of filthy and badly equipped Soviet soldiers poured into the villages and towns in Poland's eastern provinces. The town lying on the bank of the Niemen River was one of the biggest garrisons in the interwar period. Between 20th and 22nd of September, this town valiantly resisted the Soviet attack. Boy Scouts and junior high school students fought with regular soldiers. Defenders destroyed several dozen tanks, both in the city and in the suburbs. During fighting, the Soviets collaborated with the communist Jewish militia using Grodno eaglets as human shields. Captured Polish officers and Boy Scouts were immediately shot and many defenders were run over by Soviet tanks. Again, civilians were also murdered. Soviet soldiers indoctrinated in communism from youth terrorized people of bourgeois Poland. They plundered, raped and perpetrated mass murder. The number of victims has never been confirmed.
Пошла на хрустика. At the edge of Campinos Forest, from December 1939 until February 1941, SS officers and German police shot approximately 1,700 people during AB action. Many victims were the Polish political, intellectual and cultural elite. Among the victims were Marshal of the Lower House Maciej Rataj, co-founder of the Labour Brigades of the City Defence in Warsaw, Mieczysław Niedziałkowski, and Olympic champion from Los Angeles, Janusz Kosociński. the first days of occupation, Polish Catholic priests were exterminated by the Soviets in Czortków and by the Germans, particularly in the lands incorporated into Third Reich, like Szpęgawski Forest. In the territory of the ex-Prussian annexation, the local community with German origins participated in the executions. They belonged to the paramilitary troops of Zetsprzuts. The biggest massacre took place in Piaśnica near Wejheru, so-called Kashubian Katyn, where they murdered approximately 14,000 Poles. Even today, the total number of Polish citizens killed by Germans, Soviets, Ukrainians, Belarusians and Jews during the first period of war is not known. Prisoners were beaten and tortured during interrogations. The NKVD were experienced in the extractions of confessions. For weeks prisoners were beaten until they would finally admit to crimes they had not committed. NKVD officers were masters in breaking the human psyche. In December 1939, planning began for the expulsion of the Polish military settlers and foresters. Mass deportations occurred in February, April and May-June 1940 and the fourth wave not fully completed in May-June 1941. At the absolute minimum of 315,000 Polish civilians were deported. Including the deported POWs and those sent to labor camps, the arrested and those forced into the Red Army, over one million Polish citizens were repressed by the Soviets. The second deportation in April 1940 took mainly women and children, the family system of enemies, such as soldiers, policemen, officials and teachers according to the article number 59 of the Soviet Penal Code. Those who survived several weeks of transportation then had to fight for their lives on the Kazakh steppes.
The Soviet regime's Polish prisoners, who were a free workforce for the USSR, had to work under exorbitant labor norms. Not fulfilling these norms met with the reduction of or total lack of food rations. Many Poles who were deported were sent to the Siberian forest to cut wood. Forced labor was directed to everyone between 16 and 60 years old, yet often this was extended to 14 and even 12 year olds. Extremely cold temperatures, often below minus 40 degrees Celsius, 10 to 12 hours a day and a 6 days a week of work, sadistic guards and grogginess caused many deaths among the prisoners. Disability illness were not excused. Some of the deported people, first and third wave, were used to slave in mines of iron ore, gold, silver, copper, coal or lead scattered over the Soviet Empire. According to a report from one lead mine on the Tukti Peninsula, no Polish prisoner ever returned. Prisoners slept in wooden barracks, often so full that it was impossible to move. They faced hunger, cold and diseases. The Russian criminal prisoners were dangerous, protected by the NKVD guards they robbed, raped and beat the other inmates. Praying was also prohibited. Prisoners Zex were often punished by detention in small cages, very often in excavated holes which were filled with water. A terrible fate met sick prisoners. In makeshift hospitals there were no medicines. Additionally, scurvy disease destroyed inmates physically and mentally. Long-serving Soviet guards separated from the rest of the world in these camps lost their humanity. Women were exposed to rape and humiliation. According to Soviet law, children born in the camps could only stay with their mother for 18 months. They were then fated with the camp orphanage.
With the Politburo's decision of 5th March 1940, the fate of almost 22,000 Polish citizens, including over 10,000 Polish army officers and other uniformed services, was sealed. From April, the NKVD systematically murdered all these prisoners by shot to the back of the head in the prisons of Minsk, Kiev. In the NKVD's basements of Kharkiv, Smolensk and Kalinin, and in the forest of Katyn. We still do not know all the locations of this murder or the places of the victim's burial. After the German occupation of the Vilna region, Lithuanian collaborators from the Sao Guomo secret police and Ipatingasis task force proceeded to exterminate Jews and Polish intelligentsia in Ponary, near Vilna. These criminals with German approval first robbed their victims and then brutalized them with great cruelty. With Germany losing the Eastern Front from mid-1943, the Lithuanians began to obliterate the evidence of their crimes by burning the murdered corpses. In the Polnary massacres, 80 to 100,000 people were murdered. Lithuanian collaborators committed genocide in many other places of the Polish Vilna region. In June 1940, the first Polish prisoners from Tarnovo were sent to the newly built KL Auschwitz. Only 200 out of 700 people survived this nightmare. In autumn 1941, KL Auschwitz was extended with Birkenau. From 1942, the railway platform was a scene from Dante's Inferno, with a selection of Jewish families, particularly those from Hungary. Over the main gate of KL Auschwitz was a German slogan, Work sets you free. These words became a symbol of the extermination of millions of prisoners in all German camps. Prisoner parades were very long, lasting several hours. Prisoners were forced into slave labor. The aim was to break and thereby kill them. Many people committed suicide because they could not stand the camp conditions. Many companies and industries used this free workforce provided by KL Auschwitz. Among them were EG Farben Industrie, AEG, Bayer, BMW, Daimler, Benz, Photo Agfa, Siemens, Telefonken, Solvay, Volkswagen and many others. This must be remembered. KL Auschwitz prisoners were placed in brick blocks of pre-war Polish army's barracks, which were extended over time. At the beginning, prisoners slept on the floor. After February 1941, three level beds were built. Blocks were created for 700 people, yet over 1,200 were kept there. After the camp extension, a washing place was built in every block, but access was restricted. Minimal food rations resulted in starvation's existence. Every crumble of bread was the chance of another day. Besides Poles and Jews, several other European nations' citizens were murdered. In July 1941, after the successful escape of one of the prisoners, the Germans chose ten people to die in a starvation bunker. Among them was Franciszek Gajowniczek, a Polish army sergeant. When he cried out with grief that he would never see his family again, prisoner number 16670 stepped out of the line. He made a proposition to Fritsch. 
the camp commander, that he wanted to swap with Kajovnicek. The shocked SS officer agreed. Prisoner number 16670 was eventually killed with a phenol injection on 14th of August 1941 in the cellar of Block 11. Franciszek Gajowniczek survived Auschwitz and Sachsenhausen dying of natural causes in 1995. He was living evidence of the holiness of Maximilian Kolbe, providing a testimony for his canonization. A wall in the courtyard of Block 11 was a place for shooting prisoners. For the smallest offence, on the whim of a guard, prisoners were punished in many different ways. It could be flogging, standing punishment, put in the death block, physical exertion causing death or by a shot to the back of the head. Among the German staff were also women. One of them was Irma Grez, called the Beauty Beast, due to her brutal bullying of prisoners. She always carried her richly decorated whip and learned to attack people dog. She also committed sexual abuse on young Poles. In May 1943, Joseph Mengel, the so-called Death Angel, arrived at the camp. He participated in several dozen selections on Birkenau railway platform. Yet in Auschwitz he conducted experimental pseudo-scientific research. He turned his attention to twins, conducting inhuman experiments on them. He was never punished for his crimes and died in a drowning accident in Brazil in 1979. He was one of many monsters who called themselves doctors with scientific degrees, like Karl Klauberg, or Horst Schumann, who undertook research on female sterilization. The company Bayer used this research. In January 1942, during a German Nazi conference in Wonsi, a decision about the final solution to the Jewish question was made. The cheapest way seemed to be gas chambers and cyclone B. It cost fine Reichsmarks per kilo, with 5 to 7 kilos being enough to gas 1500 people. Victims waiting to shower took 20 minutes to die in pain. The high number of victims brought with it the problem of removing corpses. Even after building four immense crematorium complexes in Birkenau, corpses were burned in deep holes as well during the Hungarian action. There was no wastage in the German annihilation machine. Ash and unburned bones were smashed into powder, used afterwards as a lower layer for road construction or in fertilizer production. Hair was disinfected and after drying sold to German companies like Schaffler as a material for fabric production. Cut body parts were used for scientific research in medical universities. Teeth made out of gold and precious metals were given to the SS Dental. In the Gdańsk Anatomy Institute, Professor Spanner produced soap out of human remains and in the Buchenwald camp, gloves and belts were made out of human skin. On 22 June 1941, the friendship and cooperation between Germany and the USSR ended. The Third Reich attacked Stalin in Operation Barbarossa. After the Great Purges, the Red Army was without its command cadre and was not prepared for the Blitzkrieg. This resulted in huge losses. Two 
days after the German attack, Beria, the head of NKVD, proposed the execution of prisoners charged with anti-Soviet and counter-revolutionary activity, sabotage and diversion. The murderous slaughter of over 40,000 prisoners detained in so-called Western Belarus and Western Ukraine, as well as the Vilna region, began. Great brutality was used against victims in the Lvov prisons of Brigitki and Zamarstyniv. Were entering Lvov, even the German soldiers were shocked with what they saw. Not less than 15,000 people were murdered and over 20,000 were killed during the evacuation to the east. Several hundred prisoners in Dobromil gathered from Przemysl were murdered with an iron hammer bashed to their head. The corpses were thrown into the shaft in Latsko Solina. When the Soviets invaded the eastern borderlands, the Jewish population collaborated with the occupier and this was reported by the resistance to the Polish government in exile in London. With the outbreak of war between Germany and the USSR, a small percentage of Poles sought revenge. In Jedwabne, Germans killed over 300 Jews, forcing several dozen Poles to participate in this crime. The case of alleged mass murder of the Jewish population by Polish neighbors was, and still is, used and propagated around the world by anti-Polish publicist Jan Tomasz Gross. The first massacres perpetrated by Ukrainian nationalists occurred in September 1939. Besides the local Polish community, Ukrainians killed Polish soldiers retreating towards Hungary. The number of victims reached several thousand. The Parosla massacre in February 1943 was committed by UPA and was a prelude to the Vowin massacres. On Sunday 11th July 1943, the biggest and most coordinated attack of UPA and OUN bandits took place against Polish towns and villages. Particularly dramatic were the crimes committed during Holy Mass and churches located in Kiselin, Poritsk, Hrynów, Krymn and Zabłoc. Some of the faithful, defending themselves on the upper floor of the church in Kiselin, managed to fight off the attacks. The faithful in other towns were not so fortunate. Priests were murdered next to the altars. In Poritsk, after murdering the Poles, the Ukrainians desecrated the temple. Then they tried to explode and burn it. During Holy Mass, multi-generational families were killed. The logistics of attacks by UPA were repeated, which means that it was a certainly organized action and not independent acts by local bandits. The village was surrounded very carefully so that nobody could escape. Afterwards, the slaughter of defenseless civilians began, in which not only UPA members participated, but also Ukrainians from surrounding villages who were armed with pitchforks, axes, scythes and other farm tools. The Poles were tortured and butchered in the most horrifying ways. The worst fate met women, children, activists and priests. Historians have counted about 200 methods of torture in this genocide. By this means, in these lands, a free Ukraine was to be raised.
Orthodox clergy in Polonia and Greek Catholics in Lesser Poland participated in these massacres, and many more refused to condemn them. The Archbishop of Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church from Lvov, Andriy Sheptitsky, never spoke out against the genocide. Furthermore, he supported the German formation of the 14th Waffen Grenadier Division of the SS, 1st Galician, made up of Ukrainian volunteers. After taking over a town and murdering its Polish civilians, the Ukrainian aggressors robbed and then celebrated their success. Captured Poles were used as living training targets. They were used firstly as victims and for new bandit members too. Villages were completely burned to the ground. Even today there is no sign of several hundred of these villages. In this time of slaughter, UPA members killed Poles in mixed families. They even forced mixed family members to kill each other. We will never know how many heroic Ukrainians lost their lives trying to save Poles. From the spring of 1943, Polish self-defense outposts were created in Wołyn. Many of them were killed by the Banderowcy. The biggest outpost was in Przebarze, under the command of Henryk Cybulski. At its peak, the outpost had over 1,000 defenders and about 20,000 civilians. Despite repeated attacks, they were never conquered. Together with creating German living space in the East at the turn of 1942 and 1943, the displacement of Poles in the Zamość region began. In their place came German and Ukrainian settlers. A horrible fate met over 30,000 Polish children who separated from their parents ended up in concentration camps and in forced labor. They were also subjected to brutal Germanization. This action of displacement was stopped by Polish armed resistance, which had begun with peasant battalions commanded by legendary Franciszek Kamiński. In 1942, together with the evacuation of Anders army, about 45,000 Polish civilians left the inhuman land. Over 10,000 of them were not yet 10 years old. Children were sent to almost every part of the world. Mexico, the British colonies in Africa and India, and also to New Zealand, where civilians and authorities showed great kindness and help. A number of the orphans were looked after by the great man, Hindu Maharaja Jam Sahim Jigvij Aizin Hindi, who was later pronounced by Polish children to be a good Maharaja. Those aged 14 to 18 years were formed into the Yunak Corps. After finishing their courses and becoming adults, many went to the Polish Second Corps, drenching Italy with their blood on the way to a free and independent Poland. Polish soldiers fought on every front of World War II, from the Libyan sands near Tobruk, to the Norwegian fjords of Narvik, from the meadows in Normandy to the Belarusian swamps near Lenino. Polish ships had sailed the Arctic convoys to Murmansk, the Atlantic Ocean, and to the Mediterranean Sea. Pilots fought in France, defended England and bombarded Germany. At the same time, from the autumn of 1939, in the lands incarcerated to the Soviet Union, Poles organized the first partisan troops to fight the occupant. In central Poland, excluding major Hubal's unit, squads like this started actions in 1943. The Polish resistance was the largest in Europe with the number of home army, peasants battalions or national armed forces approaching 700,000. In the United Kingdom, the Cichociemni were trade for a great role. With marginal support, the communists recruited bands of criminals to their People's Guard underground formations, which wreaked terror among the civilians 
as for an example the GL Lions Regiment of Israel Eitzman. As a result of an action by the NSZ, captured bandits were shot. NSZ troops many times, especially Svintokshiska Brigade, cleared the lands of bandits, communist collaborators or Soviet paratroopers. From the outset of war, Polish youths were engaged in partisan activity against German and Soviet occupation. One of the more famous examples of heroism was the unbreakable spirit of Janek Bitnar, aka Rudy, when tortured by the SS Gestapo. For many years nothing was said about the Poles forced into the Wehrmacht. They were both pre-war German citizens of Polish nationality and citizens of territory forced into the Third Reich. The total number is estimated at about 375,000. Half of them died and over 30% ended up in Polish armed forces in the West. On the eve of Passover, the final liquidation of the Jewish Warsaw Ghetto began. German forces and Eastern collaborators faced poor resistance of the few armed Jews. In Muranowski Square, soldiers of the Jewish Military Union put out Polish flags during the fighting. Few of them survived. After 1945, the Communists erased them from the history books. After taking over the SS and the police command of Warsaw District, SS Brigadenführer Franz Kuchera attempted to suppress the resistance of the capital's citizens by mass roundups and public executions. After the successful assassination of this criminal in February 1944, further action stopped until the Warsaw Uprising. From summer 1943, the Warsaw Ghetto ruins were used as a place to execute Pavek's prisoners. The last execution took place right after the uprising began. Following a tip-off from Lech Wojimierz of the Blue Police, a massacre took place in the Ulma House in Markova, where Jews were hiding. Germans firstly killed the Jews, next, in front of the children, they killed Yusef and his wife Victoria Ulma, who was in an advanced pregnancy. After consulting with Czech Volksdeutsche Commander Josef Kokot, the gendarmes killed the Ulma's six children, aged between 18 months and 8 years old. Crimes like this were usual. In 1942 in Chepielów, families of Kowalscy, Obuchiewicz, Skoczyls and Koszor were buried alive. In occupied Poland, any help given to the Jews was punished with death. It was different in Western occupied Europe, where it was treated with a penalty of arrest. Jan Gross, in an interview for German newspaper Die Welt, claimed that during war Poles killed more Jews than Germans. Based on article number 133 of the Penal Code, an investigation is underway regarding the false allegations by Gross. In Naniboki Forest, a group of Jews under the command of Tevye Bielski created an armed band, the so-called Bielski Partisans. Together with Soviet bandits, they fought against the AK Stopetsky unit. They treated Polish civilians with great brutality, exemplary Gracia and Naniboki. In recent years, Tevye Bielski has become a Hollywood hero. On 4th January 1944, the Soviets crossed the pre-war Polish border. The Home Army started to realize Operation Tempest. In many regions, Red Army front troops cooperated with AK soldiers, yet they were then replaced with NKVD units. In July 1944, Vilna was liberated following the successful operation Gate of Dawn by the Polish Home Army. The British government censored this information, however, because Vilna was supposed to be Soviet. The eastern borderlands of the Republic of Poland bled until early 1950s with the blood of AK soldiers who continued to fight the Soviet occupants. With information about the advance of Soviet troops towards the Vistula River and watching the Wehrmacht's panic retreat from the capital, the Home Army Command decided to begin military action. At 5 p.m. on 1st August 1944, soldiers from the Warsaw District AK started Action Tempest.
the Warsaw Uprising had begun. In the first week of August, soldiers from the Hermann Groing SS Panzer and Paratroop Division and the SS Viking Panzer Division, Oskar Tillewanger and Heinz Reinfart's SS troops, Russian Bronisław Kaminski's Rona troops and Azerbaijani battalions systematically slaughtered civilians from the Vola district. Approximately 50,000 people are estimated to have been murdered in this massacre. A terrible fate awaited the civilians treated in hiding in Vola hospitals. The Germans committed unbelievable crimes. They burned alive those who were sick and injured. Doctors and medical staff heroically tried to save their patients at any cost. Later on, Germans burned hospitals in other parts of the city too. During the fighting with the insurgents, the Germans used a tactic of burned land, destroying both communal buildings and cultural relics. Many civilians were trapped in bombarded building cellars. Despite the heroic efforts of poorly armed partisans, could not defeat the elite German units. With all the districts surrounded, the only way for the Polish partisans to communicate was through the sewers. Despite extremely tough conditions, they were the path of evacuation from the old town. Germans comparing the fighting in Stalingrad never went down to the sewers. Despite this, many years after war, human corpses were found there. On the Hitler's special order, Warsaw was to be leveled to the ground. From the October all quarters of the city were systematically exploded. Until January 1945 several thousand people were hiding in the ruins of the city. Among the survivors was the composer and pianist Władysław Spielmann. With the advance of the Red Army towards the German concentration camps, the evacuation of prisoners to the Third Reich began. In January 1945, over 50,000 prisoners from KL Auschwitz were marched to a railway station 60 kilometers away in Wodzisławiu Śląski. At least 15,000 prisoners died on these death marches. During fighting to break through Pomeranian Wall, several dozen Polish soldiers were captured by Dutch SS officers from the Elster Group. After a failed escape attempt, the Poles were bound with barbed wire and burned alive in a barn. The front troops of the Red Army behaved properly towards Polish civilians on entering Poland, unlike the reserve units which looted, marauded and raped. Yet there were deadly exceptions. In the Silesian village of Przysłowice, Red Army soldiers murdered several dozen people, including children and ex-prisoners of KL Auschwitz. They also savagely raped Polish women. According to the Soviets, this was a mistake, believing that they were in Germany.
while fighting raged on the front, the big three met for the second time to set the fate of post-war Europe. Our allies gave Poland up to Stalin, allowing him to keep our eastern borderlands with such Polish cities as Wilno, Nowogrudek, Lida, Grodno, Brescht, Łódzk, Lwów, Stanisławów and Tarnopol. Stalin also had a free hand with homey army partisans. As a recompense, Poland acquired part of East Prussia and most Pomerania, Newmark and Silesia. It is widely believed that Hitler committed suicide on 30th of April 1945, yet it was never confirmed if the discovered burnt corpse was that of the Führer. The Thousand Year Reich had existed for just 12 years. The trial of German war criminals lasted for almost a year. Twelve of them were executed, seven received prison sentences and three of them were freed. The Soviets attempted to blame the Germans for the Katyn massacre failed. Soviet war criminals were never brought to justice. Colonel Salman Morel was saved from the Holocaust by a Polish family. He was a Jewish partisan and in 1945 became commander of the communist Skoda labor camp in Świętochłowice on terrain of XKL Auschwitz. Responsible for torture, rape and disease epidemics which killed over 2,000 people, he continued to further his career in the communist prison service. Indicted of war crimes, he escaped to Israel, who refused to extradite him for trial. Until the end of his life, he continued to receive a Polish pension. Although the war had officially ended, in the Bieszczady Mountains the fire was still burning. In March 1946, UPA units captured and murdered 72 Polish Army Border Security troops. 30 bodies were never found. Several days later, near the village Wisłok Wielki, a group of Polish Border Security soldiers fell into a UPA ambush. In June, the victims' bodies were discovered with signs of terrible torture. A similar action happened in Chisna in April 1947. Only Operation Vistula ultimately stopped this criminal UPA activity. Sigmund Baumann enlisted in the Polish First Army, working as a political education instructor. He became an informer for Soviet military intelligence and then a political officer in the Internal Security Corps KPW, working against the Polish Home Army. As an academic, he is today regarded as a moral authority, and in one of his interviews he claimed that communist ideas were just a continuation of the Enlightenment. He has recently been accused of plagiarism. In July 1945, in the Augustov region, an operation was undertaken by Soviet forces to get rid of Polish anti-communist partisans and sympathizers. It was possibly initiated over fear for Stalin's safety during the post dam conference. The exact number of victims in the Augustov Roundup, or Little Katyn as it became known, has never been confirmed. Some evidence suggests that the victims may be buried near the Belarus-Russian border. Kazimierz Motarski, author of Conversation with the Executor, was imprisoned and interrogated by Stalinist secret police, UB, for four years. During this time he experienced 49 different types of torture used by the UB. There is no doubt that sadistic interrogators used many more. Stanisław Sojczyński twice led attacks against the Germans in Radomsko. For this feat he was awarded the Silver Cross Virtuti Militari in 1943. As a partisan, the Soviets gave him the unofficial title, in April 1946, of Public Enemy No. 1. He was the founder and leader of the underground Polish army, KWP, resulting in his arrest and then interrogation by Mieczysław Moczar, Meko Ademko. He was executed in February 1947 and his body has never been found. In the eyes of the communist authorities, even children were a threat.
Janusz Zubryt at the age of five was arrested by the UB for cooperation with the NSZ. His parents, Antonia and his pregnant wife Janina, were killed with a shot to the back of the head by UB agent Jerzy Paul. Wolin, who became a film director and a publicist, died in 2015. He was never sentenced for murder. Witold Pilecki was a Polish Soviet war hero, participant of the September campaign, volunteer to Auschwitz, founder of the camp's resistance and later a fugitive from Auschwitz, Warsaw uprising fighter and a soldier of the Polish Second Corps. Considered as the bravest man of World War II, he was arrested by the communist authorities. His brutal interrogation was led by Eugeniusz Himczak. In a conversation with his wife, he admitted that Auschwitz compared to them was just a trifle. Pilecki was sentenced to death in a show trial in March 1948. He was executed in the Soviet method with a shot to the back of the head by executioner Piotr Śmietański from Mokotów. He is buried in Warsaw's Powonski Cemetery. Helena Wolinska Bruce, born Feiga Mindla, is better known as a military prosecutor in the communist show trials of the 1950s. She led an investigation against Home Army General Fjeldorf. In March 1968, she emigrated to Great Britain. However, the British government refused applications for extradition to stand trial in Poland. A European arrest warrant also failed to have her extradited. She died in Oxford in 2008. Danuta Siedzikówna aka Inka was a nurse in the 5th Vilno Brigade of the Polish Home Army. At just 17 years old she was captured and tortured by the UB in Gdańsk. Yet she did not reveal any information. On 28th August 1946, together with Felix Selmanowicz aka Zgonczyk, she stood in front of the firing squad. Before her death she managed to shout, Long live Poland, long live Wupaszko. A week before Stalin's death, following a show trial, legendary chief of Kaedev AK, General August Emil Fildorf aka Nil, was hung in a prison on Rakowiecka Street. Communist criminals, under cover of night, buried their victims in cemeteries and in many still unknown places. Prince of Poets, Zbigniew Herbert wrote, Therefore we have to know to count exactly, call by the first name provide for a journey. Krzysztof Szwagrzyk, a historian from IPN, led the search for Polish people killed during the communist period. He gave the victims their names back. After over 20 years as a partisan, Sergeant Józef Franczak, a.k.a. Lalek, a soldier in the September campaign, AK and WIN, was mortally wounded in a firefight against the communist authorities in 1963. He was the last of the cursed soldiers. After an autopsy, his decapitated body was returned to his family. We will never know exact number of Polish children kidnapped and Germanized in the Lebensborn program. From 1947 to 1950, Roman Hrabar, lawyer, led searches in the territory which had been occupied by Germany. The enormous work of his team led to the return of over 30,000 Germanized Polish children. Unfortunately, due to Cold War relations, this activity was then stopped. The British government did not allow several thousand Polish children to be returned, despite the fact that they were identified. They were to remain in German homes or be sent to the UK for adoption. Even today, they are unaware of their Polish origins. At the end of 1955, Polish prisoners started to return from Soviet prisons. 
between 1955 and 1959, from the eastern borderlands, over 200,000 Poles were repatriated. Among them were Czesław Niemen and Władysław Kozakiewicz. For labor workers living under the communist regime, every day became harder. Work norms increased, salaries stagnated, shops were irregularly supplied, and this caused unrest among Poznań workers. In June 1956, the Poznań protests were led by workers from the Cigielski factories. They marched on the streets, acquired weapons, took control of the prison and tried to conquer the UB office. Soviet commanders from the Polish People's Army, Rokossovsky and Popławski, brutally suppressed the uprising using 400 tanks. Fighting lasted for three days. One of the victims was a 13-year-old boy, Romek Strzałkowski. Believing that the Warsaw Treaty with West Germany was popular, the government announced on 12 December 1970 massive price increases to basic foodstuffs. Demonstrations broke out along the Baltic coast and there there were clashes with the militia. In Gdańsk the Communist Party headquarters was set on fire. In Gdynia the army opened fire on protesters from shipyards. One of the killed workers was carried on a door panel through Świętojańska street in the city. Zbyszek Kutlewski fictionized as Janek Wisniewski, became a symbol of Black Thursday. During the night victims were buried in cemeteries and for the next few years their families were prosecuted. Violent events also took place in Szczecin and Lelblok. None of the MO, SB Army or PZPR officers were ever sentenced. Credit from Western countries only calmed down the economic crisis briefly. Food price increases in June 1976 led to more workers' protests all across the country. This time, Jerek's government decided not to use weapons. Clashes took place, such as in Ursus, Plotsk and Radom. The biggest demonstration took place in Radom and pacification was brutal. Arrested workers were tortured according to the so-called Path of Health by Zomo and militia officers. Priest Roman Kotlash was tortured and killed for supporting the demonstrators. In June 1976, cooperation began between the intelligentsia opposition and the workers. In the evening of 16th October 1978, over St. Peter's Square, white smoke rose. A pilgrim from a foreign country had arrived and changed the world. On the third day of protests at Lenin's shipyard, the authorities agreed to increase salaries up to 1,500 zlotys. Lech Wałęsa announced the end of the strike. But two activists, Anna Valentinovich and Alina Pinkowska, managed to keep some workers inside the shipyard gates, transforming the strike into a solidarity strike. During the night of 12 and 13 December, telephones were turned off all across the country. Radio and TV stopped airing scheduled programs. Groups of SOMO and SB officers forcibly entered thousands of homes. At 6 a.m., General Jaruzelski's speech was aired. A war between Poland and Jaruzelski had begun. The crow had attacked the eagle. Przez wiele polskich domów przebiegają linie bolesnych podziałów. Atmosfera niekończących się konfliktów, nieporozumień, nienawiści. After tanks broke through the fence of the occupied mine, Zomo troops came in. The miners withstood the attack, however. Afterward, Zomo special troops armed with machine guns entered. They opened fire, killing nine miners and injuring 20 more. The injuries, shots to the back of the head of strikers, is proof that Zomo shot to kill.
Wrocław was the strongest bastion of solidarity. After the start of martial law, this was where solidarity was born. Joining the strikes was Dr. Kornel Morawiecki, who was editor of the Lower Silesia Bulletin. He refused to compromise with the communists and viewed conversation in Magdalenka and the Round Table agreements as a betrayal. In 2015, Kornel Morawiecki became a senior marshal in the Lower House, where there are no more PUWPs, heirs in the benches of deputies. The security service tried to repress the Catholic priests who supported Solidarity. Father Jerzy Popiełuszko, a staunch anti-communist known for his patriotic speeches, was harassed and bullied. Yet he never stepped back from his duty to God and the motherland. He was kidnapped and tortured by SB officers. Still alive, he was tied up and thrown to the Vistula. The economic downfall of the People's Republic of Poland led the communist authorities to share their power with the opposition. From September 1988, at the Council of the Ministers' office in the village of Magdalenka, with lavishly laid table, dreams about the full independence of millions of Poles were sold out. During the round table agreements and meetings in Magdalenka, the SB murdered priest Stefan Niedzielak, home army and WIN soldier, initiator of raising a cutting cross at Pawonski Cemetery. The perpetrators were never found. Father Stanisław Suchowiec, chaplain of the Białystok region of the KPN and Solidarność, have died as a result of arson of the vicarage by so-called unknown perpetrators. After completing his prison sentence for attempting to overthrow the Polish political system, sick priest Sylvester Zich was released. His remains were then found at the bus station in Krynica Morska. Signs of multiple scratches were found. For eight years the government spokesman Jerzy Urban organized weekly conferences for Western journalists. Until today he has not stopped his anti-Christian and anti-Polish statements. The first attempt to identify the communist collaborators and agents of the security services was made by Jan Olszewski's government and Interior Minister Antoni Macierewicz. Despite a successful vote, it was then blocked after a motion of no confidence during the so-called night change. The vote of no confidence was approved. Olszewski was replaced by Waldemar Pawlak. Olszewski's last speech as Prime Minister became a symbol of great patriotism, honor and concern about Poland. On 10th April 2010, Poland commemorated the 70th anniversary of the Katyn massacres. The government airplane TU-154M took off from Warsaw in early hours of the morning. On board were President of Republic of Poland Lech Kaczyński with his wife, the last president of the Polish government in exile Ryszard Kaczorowski, representatives of Katyn families and veterans organizations, commanders of Polish armed forces, parliamentarians and senior civil servants. At 8.41 a.m. Polish time, contact with the airplane was lost. Polish blood once again soaked into Katyn's land. The period described is only a fragment of Poland's thousand-year history. Moments of glory are interlaced with moments of tragedy. Feudal fragmentation, 17th century wars and the partitions did not break the Polish spirit. In an autumn 1918, a new Poland arose. Twenty years of independence, a victorious war against the Bolsheviks, a war with the Ukrainians, fighting for Silesia and Greater Poland with the Germans, an insidious attack by the Czechs and battles with the Lithuanians created a generation of steadfast Poles. The apocalypse of World War II, marked by the betrayal of our allies, despite the millions of victims, the elimination of elites, the indiscriminate damage and the loss of half of our territory, did not destroy the Polish spirit of freedom communist authorities endeavored to erase our proud past, deny our God and shape a new man. The betrayal at Magdalenka let the Red Bandits escape from punishment. Laughing in the faces of the workers and the opposition during the trials, they continued to draw their pensions. 
The pseudo-Polish government sold out the generation who had rebuilt Poland after the destruction of World War II. The Red Star was replaced with stars of EU. Polish law subordinated to the law of the Eurocrats in Brussels. Mysterious suicides, shameful acts, the persecution of young patriots described as fascists by foreign media and unlawfully arrested were continuously fought against the Polish character. As Prince of Poets Zbigniew Herbert wrote, the siege is taking a long time. Our enemies have to take turns. Nothing unites them apart from the desire for our destruction. And once again, there was nothing that could destroy our dreams about freedom. In textbooks, the truth about our history is still missing, so the younger generation only have sporting or pop heroes to look up to. Despite harassment, police provocation, militia attacks and the media's propaganda which describes our father's slogan, God, Honor, Homeland, as aggressive, the group of Independence March participants still increases year after year. Poland once again stand up for the values which past generations died for. The Polish spirit, the strong faith of our predecessors and great history cannot be enslaved. Tyle razy pragnęłaś wolności, tyle razy gnębił cię kat, ale zawsze czynił to obcy, a dziś brata zabija brat. Ojczyzno ma tyle razy we krwi skąpana, Ach, jak wielka dziś twoja rana, jakże długo cierpienie twe trwa. Ojczyzno ma tyle razy we krwi skąpana. Ach, jak wielka dziś twoja rana, jakże długo cierpienie twe trwa. Biały orzeł znów skrępowany, krwawy łańcuch zwisał szpon, ale wkrótce zostanie zerwany, bo wolności wybija dzwon. Ojczyzno ma tyle razy we krwi skąpana, ach jak wielka dziś twoja rana, Jakże długo cierpienie Twe trwa Ojczyzno ma Tyle razy we krwi skąpana Ach jak wielka dziś Twoja rana Jakże długo cierpienie Twe trwa
królowo polskiej korony Wolność, pokój, miłość dać racz By ten naród boleśnie gnębiony Odtąd wiernie przy Tobie mógł trwać O matko ma Tyś królową polskiego narodu Tyś wolnością w czasie niewoli I nadzieją, gdy w sercach jej brak Ojczyzno ma Tyle razy we krwi skąpana Ach, jak wielka dziś Twoja rana Jakże długo cierpienie Twe trwa